What I want to cover for you right now is I want to demonstrate that the name of God and the name of the Lamb are one and the same, and that the name is the law of God. The name of Christ, the name of God, is the law of God. Now, I know you may never have heard that before, but I want to show you the scripture verses that prove this out. We're going to come back to this, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Now, on the screen, I've put Revelation 14, verse 1. Now, we address all of this in our Revelation series. I'm kind of giving you a quick summary at a high level of the name of God is the law of God, but I want you to see this. Look at Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads, right? Notice that the name of the lamb and the name of his father are written on the foreheads of these saints. Now, I'll just say this. This is a figurative number. It's all inclusive of God's people. But the, his name, the name of the father, the name of the lamb on their foreheads. Now, back on the screen, notice this. Having his name and the name of his father right there. There is oneness, there's unity in that. And I'll just pull up on the screen, John 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, He, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature. And even John 5, 17, they say, oh, Jesus, you're saying God's your own Father. You're making yourself equal with God. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that Christ is one with the Father. No question, no doubt about that. So the name of the Lamb and the name of the Father written on their foreheads, it's one and the same name, right? It's the same name. Now, it's written on their foreheads. Now, hold that thought. I just want to say this. That's a contrast with the mark and the number of the beast. Pick it up in Revelation 13. I'm going to show you the flow of this because I want you to see the contrast between the name and the mark and number of the beast compared with the name written on the foreheads of the saints of God. Revelation 13, verse 16. And he causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the freemen and the slaves to be given a mark. Where? A mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then, yes, here is wisdom, 666. Verse Revelation 14, verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Now, the point is this. Think about this. You have a contrast between those who are going to serve God and those who aren't going to serve God. If you're going to take the mark of the beast, you're going to take it on your right hand or on your forehead. But if you're going to serve God, you're going to take the name of of the Father and the name of the Lamb on your forehead, right? Now, this is the one thing I want to point out. The mark, the name, the number of the beast, it is not a physical tattoo. It is not a physical device that is going to be on your hand, right? It is not going to be some sort of tattoo that goes on your forehead, right? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to remove any doubt you may have about what I just said. It has nothing to do with that. I want to demonstrate this from the scriptures. This is really important. Watch this. Think about this. What actually in the Old Testament went on their foreheads? Something went on their foreheads. We get a clue. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Notice this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, right? 
You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and you, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Verse 8, here's the key. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Now, the key here is, this is, he's, in the context, he's talking about the commandments of God. They shall be as a sign on your hand and frontals on your forehead, meaning you will walk in obedience to the law of God in action and in deed. And you will believe it in your own heart and mind, right? That's, that's the heart, really, your forehead. That's your heart, even though your heart's here physically. This is your heart. This is your mind. You'll believe it. You'll believe, I want to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind. I want to love others as myself. You'll believe it, and you'll do it. Right? That's what this is about. And that's why this contrast between the mark and number and name of the beast on the hand and the forehead is a contrast between the law of God. No, how do we know this? Take a look at this next scripture verse. Very exciting. Deuteronomy 28, 58. If you are not careful to observe all these, the words of this law, which are written in this book, to fear this honored and awesome name, the Lord your God. Now, let's closely examine this, this verse right here. Keep, stay on the screen. I'm going to underline the two infinitives, to observe and to fear. Notice, if you are not careful to observe something, something, and to fear something, something. Well, what's the comparison? If you are not careful to observe all the words of this law, which are written in this book, and to fear this honored and awesome name, the Lord your God. See, you have a parallel construct here. What are you to observe? You're to observe all the words of this law. And what, what does that mean? In another way of saying it, it means to fear, to fear what? To fear this honored and awesome name, the Lord your God. So if you fear, if you fear the honored and awesome name, the Lord your God, what are you doing? You're observing all the words of this law, meaning you're keeping the law of God. There you have it right there, Deuteronomy 20, 50. The name of God is the law of God. Let me show you some more. 2 Samuel 6, verse 2. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name. Now I've underlined this, the very name of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned above the cherubim. Now, Notice I've got the graphic of the holy place and the most holy place, or the holy of holies. And in the holy place, you had the lampstand, the altar, the showbread. In the holy of holies, the most holy place, you had the ark of the covenant, the mercy seat, the cherubim, Shekinah glory, God's presence over that. But inside the ark were the Ten Commandments. Now, if you haven't, you, do you see how I've colored those Ten Commandments blue? Now, if you haven't seen our bluestone study, Go back, click on the link below. We'll demonstrate to you that the law of God came from blue sapphire stone, uh, stone tablets from the throne of God, the eternal throne of God. That's where the Ten Commandments came from. If you've never heard that before, click on the link below. We walk you through that full detail study. Right now, I just want to show you 2 Samuel 6, verse 2. It says, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name. Now, what's the ark of God? And it's called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts. So if the, if the ark goes by, they would say, oh, the name of the Lord, the very name of the Lord of hosts. There it is, the ark of the covenant, the ark of God. Well, what's in the ark? Ten commandments. Name of God, law of God. First Chronicles 22, verse 19. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, and build the sanctuary of the Lord God. What did we do? They were to build the sanctuary of the Lord God, all right, so that you may bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built for the name of the Lord. Wow. This sanctuary is the house of God and it's to be built for the name of the Lord. Well, built for the name of the Lord. Well, what's the, what's the centrality of the, the, the sanctuary? Yeah, the most holy place where God would dwell. And it's to be built for his name. Well, he dwells upon the mercy seat and the ark. And what's in the ark? Ten commandments. 
Now, I don't have all the scriptures up there, but as you read, you'll, as you read through the Bible, in the Old Testament especially, you'll see how the sanctuary was built for the name of the Lord, talking about the Ten Commandments. Name of God is the law of God. Here's another scripture verse, Psalms 119.55. O oh Lord, I remember your name in the night and keep your law. Wow. Look at the verbs. I remember and keep. What do you remember and what do you keep? I've underlined it. I remember your name and what do I do? I keep your law. Remembering the name of God means you keep his law. Right? Ten commandments. You shall love the Lord with all your God, with all your heart, soul, and mind. You shall love others as yourself. Notice this, Psalm 78, verse 10. They did not keep the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. Okay, right there in that scripture verse, right there, they did not keep what? What, what did they not keep? They didn't keep the covenant of God. And what did they refuse to walk in? His law. See, the covenant of God is the law of God. Now, why am I pointing this out? Because I want to really underscore something here. Go back to Deuteronomy 4, verse 11. I want to show you that the covenant of God is the Ten Commandments. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud, and thick gloom. This is talking about Mount Sinai. Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. So he declared to you his covenant which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments. All right, so his, very clearly, his covenant, the Ten Commandments. And what did he do? He wrote them on two tablets of stone. The Lord commanded me at that time to teach you the statutes and the judgments that you might perform them in the land where you're going over to possess. All right, so no question about it. Commandments of God, law of God, covenant of God. Now, some people will say, oh, wait, oh, wait a second, wait a second. No, that's the Old Testament. That, 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 that Old Covenant was done away with. No, that's, that's not part of the New Covenant. All right, I got another scripture for you. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. This is the New Covenant. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. I've underscored that. I've underlined that. Know the Lord. Hold on to that thought. Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. You see, the only thing that has changed about the law, there's one thing that's changed about the law. You say, what? The location. The location in the Old Covenant was tables of stone. The location of the law in the New Covenant has changed to our hearts, written on our forehead, on our hands, binding them. We would actually walk in obedience. By faith, genuine faith is obedience. Now know that, watch this. Back on the screen, Jeremiah 31, 33, I've underlined in verse 34, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. Well, that's interesting. Know the Lord, for they will all know me. Let's jump to 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6. By this we know that we have come to know him. Wow, amazing. Very clear. By this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Wow. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has been truly perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Wow. By this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. See, this is... This is consistent throughout the Old and the New Testament. The location of the law, the only thing that's different is the location. From tables of stone to the tables of our heart. Notice what Jesus says this in John 17, verse 13. Very powerful statement, he says this. He says, this is eternal life. I've underlined this is eternal life. This is eternal life. What is eternal life? This is eternal life that they may know you. 
Wow, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, go back to John, 1 John 2, 3 through 6. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Wow, amazing. We come to know Christ because he lives within us. His name is written on us. His name is written on our hearts. We do his commandments. We keep his commandments because he loves us. Jesus even says this in the Last Supper, John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's how we demonstrate our love to God. How do we demonstrate? How do you demonstrate that you love Jesus? How do you do that? Keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. It's, it's a law of love. It's not about earning your salvation. No, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. We love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. He lays his life down for us and we say, wow, thank you, Lord Jesus, for freeing me from the guilt and condemnation of sin. Thank you, Lord, for freeing me in my daily life from the power and slavery of sin. And I know you're going to remove the presence and nature of sin. And Jesus says, that's right. I'm going to remove the presence and nature of sin when I translate your bodies, when I change this corruptible to the incorruptible. And so I want you to keep my commandments. If you really love me, you'll keep my commandments. We don't keep his commandments to be saved. We keep his commandments because we are saved and we want to walk in full faith and obedience. Now, having said all that, name of God, law of God, you see how, let's go back to Matthew 7, 19 through 23. I'm going to read it slowly and let, I, want, I want you to see if you, if you see the connection now. It should be very clear now. Matthew 7, 19 to 23. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Now watch this. Now you, now you can see it com coming out. This, 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 this scripture verse should be popping out at you right now. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Wow, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, if you really know God, you have genuine faith and you're going to walk in obedience because the new covenant, the eternal covenant is the law written on our hearts that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, that we would love others as ourselves. That's the beauty of all this. The name of God is the law of God. I will say this in closing. There's going to be a great controversy over the name of God in the very end of time. Right before Christ returns, there'll be a controversy over the name of God. And when I say the name of God, I'm talking about the law of God, right? Because there's a contrast between the mark and name and number of the beast, which is on the hand or the forehead, and the name of God, which is written on the forehead, the Lamb of God and the God the Father is written on the forehead. Because if it's written on your hearts, you're going to do it, right? You don't need the law of God on your hand anymore, right? It's part of you. It's the Holy Spirit code written on your heart, written on you. Holy Spirit, Christ living in and through you to walk in obedience. There's going to be a controversy over the law of God. Now, we cover all of this in our, in our we demonstrate this in our Daniel studies. Uh, we show the controversy over the laws of God and the laws of men. We then go into Revelation. We show you exactly what is the contrast. We identify the mark of the beast, the name and number of the beast, and how it is an attack on the law of God, number one. But number two, it is an attack on the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. And we do that all in the Bible. Like what you see? Subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Or you can go to angelsintheglen.org. That's angelsintheglen.org. We've got an entire series for you to take you through the events that must take place before Christ returns. God wants his people ready. It's not a time to fear. It's a time to be ready. I hope you'll join us.